You'll see there's various kinds of artwork on the different walls here. Much of it is mine, some of it's Debbie's. There's some by other people also. And on this wall, there are a whole series of my mezzotints. This one of gladioli. Deborah's late father loved gladioli, and so I did a bunch of, for her to give away. And this is a translation in black and white of what was once a very colorful picture by the Dutch. And here's to us a four-plate mezzotint in which each color is printed one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other in succession. And the next one is a mezzotint of a cloister photograph taken in Italy. And it's a good example of the rich velvety blacks that can be achieved by mezzotints without any acids or chemicals, just a lot of elbow grease. And here is another four-plate color mesotint in which the yellow is more prominent and especially where the blue is over the yellow on the creamer you get this pale sort of green. And the next one is slow motion. This was actually a machine back in the 20s which was attached to the movie cameras. It was sort of like a governor which prevented the movie camera from going too fast so they were able to do slow motion pictures. And in the last one over here, this is from a photograph that I took in the early morning, actually in Lakeland. I was very interested in the shadows. And it has a kind of an Edward Hopper look, to, for, to me anyway. But it's really a straightforward mezzotint. Mezzotints tend to be rather static. It's a very versatile medium, but Many of the artists who do mesotints seem to want to depict inanimate things. You know, like the top of a desk with the books on it or that sort of thing. And it does tend to be very static. You look at it, it looks at you, nothing else happens. Now some people, some artists, they have such expertise in doing mesotints that they, they really look like photographs. And so I always think, so what? Take a photograph. However, if you combine with dry point, which means basically just scratching the plate somehow, in addition to mesotinting, they become very much more dynamic. And here's some good examples of that. As you can see, this first one, there's a horse in the middle. Part of it's been mesotinted. Then there are two figures, one on each side, taking care of the horse. They're not, they're just scratched. And then around it is a frame that is made of mezzotinty. And here's another one. This one, incidentally, not only was rocked, but it was also scratched with, with uh, emery paper, sandpaper. A lot of those markings are sandpaper, and then that's burnished out. Here's one that's much more typical. As you can see, there's mezzotinting in the left-hand corner and a lot of dry point elsewhere. Likewise, this one. Top right, bottom left, all mesotin. The rest all scratching and scraping. And this one is sort of a blend of everything. Probably doesn't really fit in with this quite as well as the others do as examples. So here we are in the studio. I know it looks an awful mess, but if somebody ever tidied it up, I'd never be able to find anything. These are a couple of pieces of roofing copper I have to put away as I'll find them when I need them. As you probably can see, I like to do lots of different things. I like painting, I like printmaking. I like so many things, I like to do all of them. That doesn't mean all of them are done equally well, but they are the things that I enjoy doing. When I retired some years back, I said every day will be Sunday. Well, I work every Sunday. In fact, I'm out here every day. Even if on occasion, I don't have something special to do. I find that if I come out here and start fooling around, pretty soon an idea will develop or something new will come up and I'll find myself working quite hard. It's a bit difficult in the summer. It gets very hot out here. By 11.30 or so, it's, uh, it's really time to go indoors. But uh, at this time of the year, what is it, November the 4th, I think? It's just beautiful out here. 
couldn't be nicer. Here in the studio, which my wife Deborah occasionally calls David's playpen, I will demonstrate some of what we do in the way of making mezzotints. Uh, there are three things I need in the studio. One of them is a good fire extinguisher. Another one is a good exhaust ventilation. And last but not least, I need classical music. Most of the time, what one uses to do a mezzotint is copper. Copper is the most suitable me metal, although it can be, if one wants, done on steel. It's a lot harder to do. Or even brass, which is terribly tough. The copper that I use, however, is roofing copper. Now, you can also get copper in 16 and 20 gauges, and if you do, you have to bevel the edges, but I don't. I use roofing copper, which is thin, and, but not so thin that you cannot use both sides, and you do not have to bevel the edges. In order to produce the rich velvety black that is typical of the mezzotint, you rock the plate with a series of tools, and I'll show some of them. This is a two and a half inch rocker. It's curved, beveled, and the teeth are here. You can see the lines, the grooves, so that when you sharpen it at an angle, they all become tiny points. There are 85 points to the inch. And sometimes when you use this rocker, you'll find that you're digging in at the ends and leaving unpleasant deep marks. So to avoid that, one can use a bigger rocker, such as this one, the six inch rocker. If you have to get into some tight little corners, I have a one inch rocker. These three are quite adequate for everything I do. There are also much rougher rockers like this one, which has only 45 points to the inch. So when you rock a plate, you end up by completely covering the surface with tiny pits and burrs. Here's one I did this morning. It took me about two hours to do this much rocking. And uh, I'll just draw a quick diagram of what you're actually doing with these. If this is the plate and you're digging into it, which you do, you throw up a burr like this, very much very much like a boat going through water would throw up two bow waves. But in this instance, you just have the one. And when you ink the plate, the ink goes in here and is trapped there. And this, as I say, produces the richest, most velvety black that any printing p method can produce. Now, if I was to push down on this burr, so that it's like this, it would not be able to hold as much ink. And so instead of a rich black, it would become a gray or a lighter and lighter tone, a middle tone, and that's why it's called mezzotinto. Mezzotinto. And if I was to take a scraper of some kind and I scrape this right off, then it's going to print for the most part white or close to it, depending upon how much plate tone is left behind when the person wipes the plate. The other methods of doing intaglio prints, which this is, well, there are only three basic kinds of printmaking. You can print from above the surface of the plate, which is what a woodblock or a lino cut is. You can print on the surface of the plate, which is basically lithography or um, silkscreen, even stencil could be referred to as surface printing. And you can print from below the surface, which is called intaglio. Lovely Italian word. You can print from below the surface, for instance, if you etch with acid. The, what happens is you cover the surface with some sort of protective coating, you scratch through it, the acid gets down there and eats away and makes a, uh, an area here which can trap ink. Or you can use um, various other tools to affect the surface. One of them, of course, is engraving, where you have a, a V-shaped or other shaped engraver and it actually en engraves 
that ink makes a groove which traps the ink. So there are other kinds of intaglio printing, but mezzotint is the one that we're talking about. So here we have a plate, half of which I have rocked and half of which I haven't. It was cleaned with Bar Peeper's Friend. It's a, it's a chemical material, but it doesn't scratch or hurt the surface, but it takes away fingerprints, oiliness, oxidation, and it cleans the plate to look like this. Most of the roofing copper that I get has sort of scratches and dents, but not too many dents. And it absolutely doesn't matter, because you're going to rock it anyway. I'll show you what I mean by rocking. This has a lot of little teeth. Let me just get my magnifying glass. Perhaps you'll have a better idea. I'm not sure that you'll be able to see it, but these tiny teeth are all along the edge. You can feel them with your fingernail easier than you can see them. So here, let's start rocking. I'll leave a little space here, and I'll start rocking this plate. It's interesting to me that when I rock a plate like this, the rock always moves towards me. And yet the people I have shown this method to and try to teach, people who are willing to work at it, it always seems to move away. I cannot explain this. So what you actually do when you're rocking is you're going back and forth making numerous, innumerable tiny little pits and little burrs. Now obviously, as you can see, this is only partial. Next you have to rotate it a little and start doing it again. And in fact, you continually rotate it and rotate it and rock and rock until you wind up with a completely matte sh sh surface that is free of, sh of any s light reflection. Now this goes on for whatever length of time it takes. You may be able to see that, in fact, at the corners, there is a tendency for it to go deeper than you want. And that's why if the plate is large enough, I'll use my 6-inch one. This has a 14-ounce uh, lead sinker on it to give it a little bit more heft, make it a little easier. And you continue like this until you've actually completely prepared the surface so that you have a, a surface that if you were to print from it will print using black ink, completely black. Now I'm not going to do too much of this, but the next question is how do you have an image on here that you want to work on? What do you do to put an image on here? Years ago we had um, some very good typewriter um, paper and you could press on that and it would leave a good mark on the copper. It doesn't seem to work too well anymore. On the other hand, you can use Indian ink. You can use these big pens to draw on it. Or, as you can see, or, in fact, if the image requires it, you can, you can offset the image. And I'll just show you what I mean by that. I have many, many drawings, books full of them. Most of them are very simple. I don't complete the drawings because if you complete a drawing, it leaves nothing else for the ma imagination. And serendipity and chance don't have an opportunity to end mistakes to improve your work. So it's a good idea not to, for me, to finish a work. If I do finish a work and I try to make a mezzotint from it, it's like imitating myself. It's much better if I have just a line out drawing and then let it develop from there. At least it is for me. Where the ideas come from is hard to say. Many of them occur as a result of sitting and reading a book. You, you read something and suddenly it strikes you as very interesting and, and an image comes to mind. Many of them are from two disparate ideas that intersect and where they intersect an idea comes. And maybe sometimes you're touched by an angel. Anyway, here is a drawing. A drawing that is typically 
or a robotic-like figure dominating by cruelty. What I do is I put a piece of plexiglass on here and I use one of these finer points and I scratch through. By using plexiglass I can put a drawing under here, I can put one of my photographs under here, any other image that I want and I can scratch right through it. And when I have scratched right through it, then I can ink it. Just go over and ink it. Here is the scratch through image. Ink it and don't wipe it too carefully. Leave a lot of ink on it and then run it through the press and print it, leaving a lot of ink on it. You end up with a, with a very dirty looking print, but it's got a lot of ink on it. Actually, there was one on the other side too. Then you again, once more, run it through the press. You place your copper that has been cleaned with your barkeeper's cleaner so that the water sheets off it so it's full, uh, completely free of ink or any oily material. You run it through the press and the result is that you have an image transferred or offset onto the copper. Now comes the rocking, which I just showed you. And as you rock the plate, you, you conceal it. But the marks that were offset don't get concealed. You can always see the drawing through the rocking. You can reinforce it. In fact, years ago, people sometimes used to etch the image before they even started the rocking to make sure they didn't lose it. But it's not usually necessary. Once you have this image, you can then proceed to rock it, and then you have to burnish the image. To burnish an image, you need something like a tool of this kind. I have a much finer one here. There, smaller one. One of the best ones I have is actually made from a dentist's uh, tool. They use a very fine nickel, I think it's nickel steel. Very tough, because they don't like these things to break off in people's mouths. And then you grind it down and use a stone, which I have here, to make it very smooth. And these two, for that matter, can be made more smooth. And then you burnish the image. Now, in order to burnish the image, it simply means I'm going to press down those little burrs. And here, I'll just do it for a moment. Now, if we were to print this, this put all print black, and this would be much, much lighter. And if I want it really light, I have to scrape the burrs off. This is a typical scraper. It's quite sharp. In order to keep it sharp, you're constantly having to sharpen all your tools, but this one in particular, it helps to sharpen it because you do not want to make dig holes with it. You just want to scrape burrs off. And you know when you're scraping burrs off because a little bit of copper dust will form. See it? Little copper dust. That means that the little burrs have been scraped off. Of course, you don't have to scrape it right down to the copper. You can actually use it for shading in this manner. Or you can scrape it very firmly and gradually scrape it with less and less force so that it's going from white to gradually darker and darker and darker. And once you've done that, you take your burnisher and improve on it. I'm really pressing down anything else that's still sticking up. It helps use a little nose grease. One of the best lubricants in the, available in the body. So that you can start off with a very nice, heavy, heavy uh, amount of pits and, and burrs and gradually work it down until it just sort of goes into a shading far from white. Sometimes you can't get it perfectly white because a certain amount of plate tone will remain on the plate. But there's no reason you can't use a Q-tip or something else to get rid of it. And sometimes if you just rub it like this, it rubs the ink out of there and into the uh, surrounding area. So sometimes there are little tricks that you can do to enhance the weight. 
But make sure it's very evenly burnished. You go from one side to another in this sort of manner. See here where it's been scraped and then burnished? And over here where it sort of was being burnished more and more gently so that it would print from white through various tones to grey. And of course that's why it's called mezzotint. Mezzotinto. Middle tones, in other words. As to the inspiration that produces them, well, the spirit goes in somewhere. And we feel that we can produce something. So we'll, we'll print this particular image. It's already been editioned, so it won't look that good. These plates do tend to wear down the copper plates. They can be steel-faced, which is actually iron, not steel. They can be, and then they'll print almost indefinitely. I mean, etchings and so forth of Rembrandt are still being printed. The, uh, they've been steel-faced, and they'll go on forever. So now we're going to ink this plate in order to print it. I have my ink ready. It's black ink, to which I've added blue. I don't care for the brown blacks. I prefer the blue blacks, the deep blue blacks. And I just use mat board to spread the ink. You can use a brayer, but I just use mat board. Having done that, we have to clear the edges. So, put on my gloves. And I use the plastic surgical gloves because they last much longer. Rubber tends to perish as a result of the oil-based inks rather rapidly. And it's nice to have something thin enough so that you can really feel what you're doing. You should have gloves, it helps. It's possible, you see, to get hurt doing these things. There are three ways you might get hurt. For once, you could wear out your shoulder, rocking. The edges of these plates can also become kind of serrated and rather rough, like little sawtooths, so you have to sand the edges. And the other thing is, when you're rocking, don't get your finger in the way. Now, we wipe off the edges because you don't want a blob of ink to suddenly squeeze out and ruin the, the print. If the print is dirty, you throw it away. So we start off with this tarlatan, and we just remove the excess ink. Remember now, most of the ink will be trapped under those burrs that we mentioned. Perhaps some of it in the it's, it's trapped also in the uh, little pits, but it's mostly the burrs which do the work. For the sake of speed here, we'll just wipe it like this, which pushes the ink out of the lighter areas and into the darker areas. This, incidentally, is a heating device, because in the winter it gets quite cold out here, and not only does it get cold, but your ink gets so thick. The ink that I'm using comes in tubes. I've pretty much given up buying it by the pound in cans because it usually goes to waste. It gets ruined, turns hard as a rock. By the time you want it, the next time it's not useful. To get into tiny little corners, I use a pencil tip. After all, it's carbon. We're using carbon. Then I want to have these eyes very bright. And also the handle of the whip, like so. So now, check it, be sure, because a little dust gets on it, or one of your hairs drops on it, it'll print, and it'll ruin your print. So now we go to the press, and I set it down here, in a position that I know just about where my paper is going to be. And usually, if I'm printing an edition, I shall also put my little monogram here, which I can't find. So this is the paper that we use. The paper is archival paper, 100% rag, pH 7 or neutral, and it has to be blotted. And this paper is Magnani Pessia. It's my preferred paper. So it has a nice smooth surface. It's very sensitive. And if you make a mark on it, you can use the other side. It makes very little difference. We've used BFK and... Uh, all sorts of different papers, Lana, but this one's the best. And the paper should not be shiny wet, because a film of water can repel the oil from the ink. 
So one has to make sure that it is not shiny in places. And then it has to be placed on the on the plate. And check to see the size is about right, and it is. And set it down like this. I put some newsprint on the top so that the blotter blot up any excess water so that the blankets don't end up getting wet. And then this comes down on top of it. I have found that this stuff, which is the material that usually lies underneath expensive carpets, works just as well as the felt. Although a set of felt uh, blankets runs almost a hundred dollars, this is cheap. And now we're just having adjusted this, we now run it through the press. In this instance, we're going to run it both ways. This way first, and then we reverse it and bring it back this way. Okay. It's a very easy machine to run. Pull these back, uncover this. You can see the embossment that the plate has made in the paper, paper being soft enough. And here's the print. You might like to see how this particular print looks as a white line print. I wasn't too satisfied with it. I felt that more could have been done with this print than I did. And so I abandoned that re-rocked it and uh, then printed this having having burnished out a new image. This image by the way is of a print that has already been additioned and you cannot leave it floating around as an extra outside of the addition so one destroys it. I think it might be of interest just with a pencil you can indicate what the plate number is, whether it's an artist proof, that's AP, or maybe number three out of seven, or whatever the particular number is, and then you sign it over here, then you put the title right here. I've already inked the yellow plate and the red plate. Now I just have to ink the blue one, and once that is inked, we can start doing a three-plate color mesotint. The, these plates have been used a number of times. They are not in very good shape. They've been used for demonstration because it's easy to take them with me to a place that wants to see it being done. So now we're simply spreading the ink, and after that we'll have to wipe it. It's very important, you see, I have only blue everything here. There's a blue bag, there's a red bag, and there's a yellow bag. And it's kind of important to remember to keep the yellow away from the blue, or vice versa. Because if they get together, you'll only have greens. So now we have the plate, wipe the edges, and we're going to remove the excess ink. The light here is perhaps not as easy for you to see as it is for me, but the most important thing at this point is to make sure it's the right way up. It's very easy to mistakenly print it upside down. So there's the blue plate, and we can now proceed to print in three colors. Of course, where the blue overlaps the green, the yellow, it will be green. So the first plate goes down here, and we need to put some paper on it. I have the paper already blotted, like so. Now we're going to run it through the press both ways so that the camera doesn't have to be moved all the time. But basically we're just going to, we would ordinarily just do it once, but for this purpose let's do it the two ways. Keeping the yellow and the blue apart is very important, although as you continue to use the place they begin to pick up colour from each other. So from time to time, you'll have to stop and clean your plates completely and start over again. Now this is the yellow plate. 
and when it comes through you will not be able to see very much the, the yellow and the design on the plate really don't show up too well I'll show you but I don't think you'll be able to see very much and this is how it looks with the yellow you can see some light areas but essentially it's very difficult to tell now we go to the red or the magenta plate Incidentally, this has an R at the top. Not so as I remember that it's red, but so as I don't put it out down upside down. The wrong way around. Have to be careful with that word. Now, ordinarily, if a person was going to do a three plate, they'd have to be able to put this plate down in exactly the right place. And then after they put it down the right place, they'd then have to somehow or other managed to get this on top of it in exactly the right place. It was a very difficult thing to do. So I don't do that. I don't do that. What I do is I print it with the ink side face down. Artists and students have said, oh, you can't do that. Well, actually you can do it. And in fact, I've been doing it right along and it's very much easier. Of course, there are a number of different ways of making a color print. This isn't the only way. You can make a color print simply by watercoloring it. In fact, mesotints are very easily watercolored and very nice when they're watercolored. And many times that's what they used to do in the 1800s. Of course, the purists, they didn't believe it was a good idea because the black and white was the the essence of a mesotint. But in actuality, the colored ones look very nice. And also because when the plates got rather worn, hand coloring them made them look rather better. It sort of rejuvenated them. And the hand coloring of mesotints, by the way, was something that Turner did for, for a small change when he was a young man. He'd hand color other people's mesotints to make a few, to make some cash. Now, here we have put the red on top of the yellow. Consequently, in places where the red is, we're going to see orange. And here it is with the, most of the red is here because there isn't much yellow there. But the rest of it does show. You can see the yellow through and the red on top. So now we'll do the blue. I have to mention that, here it is with the B on the top. I have to mention that these plates have been used repeatedly for demonstrations for students and others to show how to do it. And they are worn, so I don't want you to anticipate a beautiful print. Uh, it doesn't work as well as it did when, they, when the plates were young. So now we set it down. I usually put the left hand bottom corner down first and then I eyeball it. If it's a little bit off, I can adjust it with my fingernail. And there will, of course, be a slight margin of the other color. What's nice about this method is it's clean. I mean, if you use a template, like a piece of wood or something cut out, so that you're going to slot the plates in one at a time, it very soon gets rather dirty and has to be, you have to stop and clean it all the time. So now, down and dirty. And this is ink face down. I'll just run it through and then reverse it again. And here we go. Some people have printing presses that are mechanized. Just push a button and it goes zzz through. The problem with that was, once I saw a girl who got her hair caught in it, and it was very difficult to stop the machine. And here's a sort of a finished print. Now, let me just assemble these for a moment. We have printed a yellow, 
then we printed a red and then we printed this blue now the thing here is where's my pencil here it is i'd like to just point out if you if you want the end of the twig to be an orangey color you have to burnish it out of the blue you can't leave it there you see you've got to burnish that out otherwise it will not print yellow and likewise you see these highlights at the top here those highlights are produced because I burnished out the tops of the plate so that it wouldn't print as blue lighter areas for instance in the green leaves here are due to either larger amounts of yellow being rocked into them or burnishing out the blue so the yellow begins to show through. I'm surprised at this particular print because there's so much red in it. Ordinarily you don't get quite as much red. In fact, just to be sure that I would get a good print from these old plates, yesterday I tried one just to see how it would come out. And also and and as you can see, there is a marked difference between the two. A marked difference because in this instance here, you're getting a lot more yellow and blue showing green, and here you're not, you're getting mostly orange. Now once again, these prints have been auditioned, uh, editioned, not auditioned, so we have to destroy them. It's quiet out here, except for my music. And I can look around at all these different things I do and it's very satisfying and very challenging. One must try to do the very best one can, not be satisfied too readily. Okay?